Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome again to the new lecture of the course Fundamentals and Applications of Dielectric Ceramics. So, let us just briefly recap what we have been doing until uh, last lecture. So, in the last lecture we finished on thermodynamics of these materials basically looking into how these properties are related to each other. So, to begin with we wrote this thermodynamic expression, uh, we calculated the free energy change that is minus of S d t minus of x i j d of capital X i j. So, this is strain this so this is strain this is stress you can also write it as sigma i j if uh, you like and uh, you can also write x small x as epsilon, but we did not use epsilon because epsilon we are using for dielectric permittivity and then you you write this as minus d i uh, d of e i where this is your uh, you can say charge density or you can say polarization and e is the electric field. So, from this we determined what are the properties such as uh, entropy that was equal to minus of del t x comma e. Uh, x i j was equal to minus of del g by del x i j at constant electric field and temperature. And then we also determine what is d i or you can also say p i as minus of del g by del e i at constant temperature and constant stress. From these we determine various, so if you write the full form of these total differential forms you can see that entropy is for example, consists of terms such as heat capacity, uh, piezo, -like, piezo caloric effect and electro caloric effect. Whereas, if you write the same expression for example, for the strain you can see that it consists of terms like thermal expansion, piezoelectric effect and uh, so that is converse piezoelectric effect as well as compliance, elastic compliance. And if you write the same expression for things like for polarization you can see it consists of terms uh, because of temperature that is pyroelectricity and then because of stress that is uh, direct piezoelectricity and then because of uh, change in electric field that is the dielectric permittivity. And you can combine these together and look at the equivalence of various parameters such as you can establish equivalence between direct and indirect piezoelectric effect. Thermodynamically effect uh, speaking both are similar right. Similarly, if you do uh, if you do if you establish equivalence between piezo caloric effect piezo caloric con connects mechanical to temperature prop, uh, right so it is equivalent to thermal expansion that is also related to expansion with respect to temperature so these sort of properties are interrelated to each other and then we wrote the constitutive equations for pi piezoelectricity so this sort of provides a little bit of mathematical and thermodynamic basis for writing these expressions in reality we use much simpler forms uh, because of symmetry and thermodynamic arguments and uh, for, for polycrystalline materials we can take them to be scalar or isotropic as a result many of the properties become simplified in polycrystalline materials. But nevertheless it is important from the sake of complete understanding to understand the um, n n uh, exact forms of these properties. So now what we will do is that we will begin in this lecture with our discussion on ferroelectric materials. So, we have looked at the equations related to piezoelectrics and we have also looked at what piezoelectric phenomena is and now we will look at uh, and the phenomena related to ferroelectric materials. So, ferroelectric materials let us just go into a bit of history of it ferroelectric materials uh, ferroelectric effect was first seen in. So, we know that ferroelectricity from the basics if I if you remember every ferroelectric is by default a pyroelectric and a piezoelectric and many of the pyroelectrics and piezoelectrics that we use in practical applications they are nothing but ferroelectrics. So, ferroelectric effect was first discovered in 1921 by Roger Wallasek. He was a Czech scientist and he discovered this in Rochelle salt 
which is nothing but K N A C 4 H 4 O 6 dot 4 H 2 O. So, it is basically a potassium sodium based salt um, that shows ferroelectricity. Now, it did not have much research uh, earlier on, but later on after the after the second world war uh, there was a renewed interest in these materials and especially Russians and East Europeans carried out a lot of work on these materials, a lot of work was carried out in US as well and Wallasek, sorry. And uh, uh, so as a result there are there are renewed interest, there were there was a renewed interest in ferroelectrics after second world war and a lot of discoveries were made, a lot of devices were made. So, it became really popular after the um, after the development of vacuum technologies because one could make thin film of these materials and these thin films were far more exciting as compared to bulk materials. For example, for ferroelectric memories and uh, data storage devices, they were very potential, they were very important candidates or very interesting candidates upon a time in 90s and 2000s. So, a lot of work was done. So, development of vacuum techniques led to a lot of thin film work. So, ferroelectrics, typical ferroelectrics are you can say Rochelle salt other than that you have barium titanate, you have lead titanate, you have PVDF, then we have PVZR TiO3 and then we have uh, SRBA2 Ta2O9 which is basically a um, orivalous kind of compound. Then we have bismuth titanate, now we have compounds such as BiFeO3, they are all ferroelectric materials. So, there is a huge variety of materials uh, which are um, ferroelectrics. So, for example, they can be divided into certain categories. You can have sulphates, various sulphates which are uh, ferroelectrics. So, you can say sulf sulphates, then we have niobates. Then we have titanates and uh, titanates and niobates many of them form to be perovskite, perovskites and then we have many of the complex oxides based on based on uh, uh, perovskite units. So, things like bismuth titanate and strontium bismuth tantalate they are all based on series of perovskite stacked together along a certain axis and then of course, as I said Rochelle salt parent compound and its compounds related compounds and then so you have sulphates, niobates, complex oxides, titanates etc. There are huge series of materials. So, if you really wanted to know about the materials I would recommend you to go through a book ferroelectric crystals by Jonah and Shiran. These two gentlemen uh, are pioneers of ferroelectrics and they have written this beautiful book ferroelectric crystals. It is a it is a book which goes through a variety of materials and gives you a good insight into uh, ferroelectricity in different materials, their structures, their properties and so on and so forth and also it treats with a bit of, bit of thermodynamics of ferroelectric materials. Now, ferroelectric materials, uh, so we will we'll see what ferroelectric material is. A, gen, a ferroelectric materials by nature, it is a nonlinear dielectric. When you switch a ferroelectric under electric field, a ferroelectric shows a hysteresis curve like this. So, just like a magnetic material, a ferromagnetic material, the ferroelectric material also exhibits what we call as a history. So, this is polarization which is in uh, typically coulomb per meter square and then voltage or electric field. Okay. So, this could be in volt, this could be in volt per centimeter or volt per meter. So, what it shows, shows is a hysteresis loop. So, essentially at 0 field you have 2 states which are plus and minus. So, we call it plus P r and minus P r. P r is called as remnant 
polarization and then this remanent polarization saturates to a polarization which is called as plus p s and here you will have so this is plus p r minus p r this is minus p s so p s is called as saturation polarization and then polarization is zero not at the zero field but at a non zero field which is called as plus ec and minus ec where ec is called as coercive field and so basically what happens is for a ferroelectric for a virgin ferroelectric you start in this fashion and then when you keep repeating the loop it just keeps making the loop again and again and again and again you do it for many cycles it will reproduce the same loop again and again so this is basically because of uh, as we will see later on formation of domains in these materials very so the switching process is uh, somewhat similar to what we see in uh, uh, in ferromagnetic materials in some sense you can call it as a electrical analog of of a ferro magnet magnetic material okay in ferro magnetic material this loop will exist between magnetic field and induced moment or uh, flux density uh, whereas in this case this is a loop between voltage or electric field versus polarization so it is polarization is charge density and this is the electric field so basically you are measuring the charge density on a capacitor and this is what you see the area under the curve is essentially the energy the product of p and e which is the uh, product of p and e is nothing but mu divided by v into e and this is nothing but the energy density so the energy that is spent in the process of switching so we will see these mechanisms of why this happen but this is a typical you can say p e or as we say hysteresis curve for a of a ferroelectric so if a material is ferroelectric a material will show a non zero polarization at zero field and the polarization is zero at some finite field and this is a stable effect so most important thing is this is a stable effect it remains stable for long time so there is another class of materials called as electrate in which this phenomena is transient it's a temporary phenomena so you will see in electrodes also similar sort of loop but that is not stable as a function of time so do not confuse ferroelectric is not a electrode is not an electrode so a lot of electrodes also tend to show similar loops maybe of not of very good quality loops but they show uh, a hysteresis between polarization electric field but that is not a permanent behavior this is a permanent behavior okay as long as your temperature is below a uh, certain temperature so what are the characteristics of a ferroelectric ferroelectric material is one it is non centrosymmetric two it is polar secondly p is reversible upon reversing the electric field these are must have requirements and additionally ferroelectric material shows a a transition at a temperature called as tc which is called as curie temperature above which when you heat it it becomes paraelectric so ferroelectric will become paraelectric upon heating at tc okay and there it shows a phase transition so generally this transition will be from a non centrosymmetric to a 
to a centrosymmetric so you can see the terms are similar just like in magnetism we have paramagnetic we have paraelectric here just like we have ferromagnetic we have ferroelectric here so there is a transition from a non centrosymmetric phase to a centrosymmetric phase at a temperature tc and this tc is called as curie temperature and then in physics language we also call it uh, there is a mode softening at tc and the soft mode vanishes that tc that is in terms of when you do raman measurement on these materials you will see a disappearance of the soft mode at tc and this is a signature of uh, ferroelectric uh, and vanishing of soft mode at tc okay this is uh, these are certain characteristics of ferroelectric material so essentially what happens so if you take a model example of let's say uh, PBTiO3, okay. PBTiO3 has a perovskite structure. If you draw the structure of PBTiO3, okay. This is the PBTiO3, which is these are all PB ions. Let's draw the oxygen ions these are oxygen ions and then we have somewhere in between we have a titanium ion this is cubic uh, pbtio3 with p being equal to 0 this is a centrosymmetric material it doesn't have a polarization it has a is equal to b is equal to c as you cool it below tc so when t is lower than tc so this is at t greater than tc as you cool it below tc this will transform into a tetragonal structure so what will happen is that this ab parameters will be different now so it will be slightly so there will be a lattice distortion leading to the formation of a tetragonal structure where so this will become tetragonal where a is b equal to b is not equal to c and this is p is not equal to 0. So, in this case what will happen is that you have uh, similar atoms sitting at various positions. this is oxygen do not worry about the sizes the sizes and this will be titanium now the titanium in this case will be slightly off centered so this is the central position so titanium will either be here or it will be here so this is the downward or upward movement of titanium so titanium is little bit shifted with respect to the dipole with respect to the the so you can see that oxygen here makes an octahedra this is oxygen octahedra right and when so oxygen octahedra will have certain charge it will have net charge of minus 4 titanium has plus 4 charge so, let us say if you do a dipole moment calculation when the center of negative charge and center of positive charge when they match with each other when it is in cubic form. So, these pluses and minuses match each other as a result mu is equal to 0. So, this is for this case. Now, when you cool it below see the central titanium atoms, atoms move up or down as a result now the center of negative charge is somewhere here this is my negative and the positive charge is either here or here. So, let us say I take one of them I take this one there is a distance delta let us say delta is in few picometers. Now, what we have is we have a dipole moment of 4 electrons multiplied by delta. So, this is a non-zero dipole moment that is developed and as a result you have a permanent dipole moment which is called as 
and that is why ferroelectric materials show a non-zero dipole moment of polarization at room temperature in the absence of electric field because they have a non-zero uh, dipole moment. So, these are polar non-centrosymmetric phases which form and this is manifested in what we call as free energy. So, when you plot the free energy of such a solid, so let us say when we take free energy as a function of distance or position of atom, let us say position of central atom. Okay. Now, when it is above T c, then free energy shows a minima, this is at x is equal to 0, x is equal to 0 means center. So, the titanium atom sits right here. However, so this is at T less than uh, greater than sorry T greater than T c. When the temperature changes, then what happens is that the free energy shows a double well kind of structure. So, there are two minimum positions, these correspond to plus x or minus x, they correspond to minus p r or plus p r. So, these are both equivalent energy position. So, this is the maxima now. So, x is equal to 0, you can see there is a local maxima. So, which means x is equal to 0 is not a stable position. Atom cannot sit here, atom has to fall either here or here. Okay. So, depending upon the local perturbations, it will either form into fall into right one or left one. So, as a result, you have two states, one of the two states which is stable as plus p r or minus p r and this is because the titanium atom now sits either here or it sits either or it sits here. Now, this is what happens in terms of free energy, we will we'll do the free energy discussion a little bit, little bit in detail. So, this is basically you can see this energy is delta E and this energy when you do the switching for example, when you go from plus to minus p r, you are saying you need to overcome this energy. So, if you look at the hysteresis for instance here, now try to relate this to hysteresis. If this is your hysteresis curve, okay. so this is P E, so you are at this state plus P R, at the switching you might, you have to go, so when you switch it completely, sorry the, the loop is not very symmetric, let me just make it symmetric, yeah, so this is minus P R and this is plus P R. So, this is 0. So, as you switch it, so you, you go from 0 field to here. So, you go from 0 field to here. Let us say this is A, you come to B, then you come to C, then you come to D, you come to E and you go to F and then this whole cycle continues. So, as you switch it, you go from 0 to A for a new material. From A, you go to B. From B, you go to C, you need to apply an extra field to bring it back to 0 polarization then you go to D, then you go to E again. So, what is happening in terms of energetics? Let us say at B you were in this position, so let us say this was B. So, from for a, for a given region for it to come from plus P r to minus P r, it must the atom must shift from B to E. So, this position will correspond to E position. So, looking at the free energy diagram what you see is that as you go from B to E, you need to overcome energy barrier of delta E and this delta, delta E is nothing but what we call a switching energy barrier, a switching barrier. So, basically how the free energy will change as you do switching. So, for example, at A, at A I am in saturation polarization state, right. So, which means all the atoms are shifted at A within. So, we can say that the free energy curve will look like this. I have applied an extra electric field. So, the wells are tilted in this direction. So, all the atoms sit here. The energy, energy to go to this direction is very high, but all of them can drop fall here. So, which means my energy wells are tilted extremely in this direction and all the atoms sit here. This is the situation at A. What is the situation at B? 
situation at B will be like this. So, both of the wells are at equal height. So, this is B, right. When you come to C, what will happen at C? You applied an electric field, but still there are some atoms here, there are some atoms here and both of them are equal right in amount. So, as a result polarization is equal to 0. When you go to D, it will all be like this. So, all the atoms come here right. When you go to E, it again goes to a sort of equilibrium, this is like this. So, so there are more atoms sitting on E than here. So, you can see that there is a minus P r, this is minus P r, this is minus P s, this is 0. So, you have all that. So, basically you can say plus P r is equal to minus P r in this case. In this case, you have plus P r. Okay. So, what minus P r will mean is that your minus P is more than plus p right and then when you go to f again uh, you will you are applying positive field but then your wells are becoming like this but then you can see plus p is equal to minus p but this is how free energy as you apply the electric field in one direction the wells get tilted to one direction and when you apply very large field they tilt in such a manner so that all the atoms hop to one direction that is when you reach minus p s or plus p s. But when you are at 0 field the wells are symmetric so but there is an uneven distribution because of switching process and some so all the, although there is an equal probability but because of the way switching has happened not all the uh, atoms of negative position move to positive position or not all the positive atoms move to negative posi position atoms. Okay. So, this is how the switching happens in these materials. Uh, we will look at the uh, microscopic aspects of switching and the free energy well and thermodynamics a little later on. Thank you.